wait, we're gonna, wait, this is much more fitting for today's video. Get it? Because we're gonna be talking about Studio Ghibli movies? Hi, Professor. <laughs> Hello, my little raindrops welcome back or welcome home my name is Desiree and it is so so nice to have you here so today's video is actually gonna be very different <laughs> than my usual content and that is because this is actually one of my final projects for a class that I have at university hi professor <laughs> so I decided to do the creative option for one of my final projects for my forest eco fiction class at university and my professor was kind enough to let me use YouTube as my platform to kind of do this creative project. And so here we are. I could have easily just made this video private and just give it to my professor, but I thought, why not share this with all of you guys? Because I know a lot of you are fans of anime and Studio Ghibli, so I thought it might interest you. If it doesn't, totally fine. You can just close the video and scroll to something else. But if you are interested, get cozy. I have a lot to say. It would probably help if I had the right journal. There we go. Let me get my presentation plan here. Right, okay. So, first things first. What is this project? Well, I decided to do a very specific analysis of four Studio Ghibli movies that have a very specific or important portrayal of forest, nature, and trees. My forest ecofiction class has been reading a lot of texts that focus on the hidden life of trees. That is one of the books that we had to read in this class. And the importance of nature, both in our ecosystems, but as well as for human life in a physical and, I guess, uh, spiritual way. And so, for any of you who have watched Studio Ghibli movies before, you will know how important nature is in those films, whether it is, like, mentioned directly, as it is in Princess Mononoke, we know how important it is to the well-being of uh, the community in this film, or if it's a more kind of background element as it is in Spirited Away and Howl's Moving Castle. Although I will not be talking about Howl in this video slash project, I will just quickly mention it just for the sake of bringing this up. But Hayao Miyazaki is a very, very strong believer in the Shinto religion, which is something I'll be talking about in a few moments. And so he really tries to incorporate this in his works, hence why I decided to do this project. I am a huge fan of anime. My followers know this. I am also a huge fan of Japanese culture. Uh, I am incredibly passionate about it. I am in complete awe of the beliefs, the myths, the, the religions, everything about Japanese culture I am absolutely passionate about. And so when I had this opportunity to kind of include what we learned about the forest and the way that trees work and bring it together with another one of my passions and hand this in using a social media platform that I very much enjoy, you know, doing. I obviously was so excited. But just for the sake of this being an assignment that will be graded, I'm just gonna go quickly into the actual structure of what this video will be. And if you go into the description, you will see the timestamps for each kind of chapter that I address in this project. So I will try to make this video as close to like an essay format as possible, but make it digital video essay. So the first thing that I will address is what is Shinto. So as I've mentioned, this is a religion in Japan and it is a huge part of Studio Ghibli movies. So I will be addressing that first and foremost. And after that, I will go into anime analysis. And the four films that I will be analyzing will be Spirited Away, Princess Mononoke, my Neighbor Totoro, and Nausicaa of the Wind. So these are the four films that I decided I was going to be using for this project. Again, there are a bunch of others that portray Shinto, but that also portray just the general importance of nature in the forest. But those are the four main pieces. And these will all be related back to books that we read in class and linked in the description in case you're interested in these. And for you, Professor, I will obviously be handing in my annotated works cited when I hand in this project. So you'll have all of those works cited at your disposal. So 
to begin, what is Shinto? Actually, I'm gonna... Where did I put that? Huzzah! I actually did some research on Shinto because obviously it is not something that I am incredibly familiar with. Although I did get a lot of knowledge about Shinto through anime, manga, and just consuming popular culture, I could not possibly state claims and not actually have a source backing up my claims, especially since this is a project. But I read Shinto the Kamiwe by Sokyo Ono to kind of get a more academic viewpoint on the Shinto religion. I will say, however, that I bought this kind of like just a sprue of the moment type of thing. I just saw it online and that it had a pretty basic description of what Shinto is. And it was also a very short read, hence why I bought it so I could start actually mapping the project a bit quicker. But this book is not the best source to actually get a very in-depth education on Shinto religion. It does, however, provide very basic descriptions of what it is, so I'll be citing from this just for like the basic definitions. But I read a lot of reviews of people saying that the author of this book was not really the best to be speaking about Shinto, so just keep that in mind. I will just be using a very basic definition which can be found even like in the dictionary or online just for a quick description of what Shinto is. On page one of this book, it says, Shinto, the indigenous faith of the Japanese people, is relatively unknown among the religions of the world, which is very true. I know a lot of people who I've brought Shinto up to and they were just completely lost about what it is. Shinto encompasses so many different things, but from time immemorial to, from time immemorial, immemorial, immemorial? I can't talk. From time immemorial, the Japanese people have believed in and worshipped kami as an expression of their native racial faith which arose in the mystic days of remote antiquity. And so what are kami? Kami are the object of worship in Shinto. What is meant by kami? Fundamentally, the term is an honorific for noble, sacred spirits which implies a sense of adoration for their virtues and authority. All beings have such spirits, so in a sense, all beings can be called kami or be regarded as potential kami. In Shinto, the beliefs are that anything have these kinds of spirits, and so anything can be considered as kami, but not anything can be worshipped as kami. Another very, very important belief in Shinto is that nature is like, above all, it's one of the most important things in uh, Shintoism and it is where most of the kami reside. You will probably realize that many 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 Shinto shrines which are most often indicated by having a tori at the entrance, these red gates, and they dedicate the entrance to the spirit world, the kami world, and this is something that I will bring up in the analysis of Spirited Away. You see a tori gate when uh, they go up the hill. Shinto shrines are most often in a natural area, most often surrounded by trees, and a lot of their worship tools, I guess you could call them, are related to nature, and they have a, a one specific tree that they use to create, to, to make um, one of their worship instruments. There we go. So, uh, the purification wand, which is called Harai Gushi, it has uh, many long paper streamers and a few strands of flax. It is for the rite of purification, and so in performing this rite, the wand is removed from its stand by a priest who, facing the worshipper or object to be purified, waves it first over his left and then the right, and finally back to the left shoulder, with a characteristic flourish before replacing it. And sometimes a small branch of the sacred sakaki tree is used instead of this wand. So the sakaki tree is of utmost importance in Shinto religion, and so this kind of ties into the whole thing about the importance of trees in the Studio Ghibli films, obviously, but also in Shinto religion and thus Japanese culture. And since Miyazaki really uses this in his works and is a firm believer of this religion, it kind of just ties everything together. Now, I could go on and on about this, but it is not the, the main topic of my project, so I'll try to tone it back a little. But really, the only thing I wanted to bring up about Shinto religion is that, first off, 
Nature is incredibly important and worshipped. There are kamis, which are these sorts of gods. I would like to reference to Kamisama Kiss, which most of you will know is my utmost favorite comfort anime and manga, where uh, Nanami, a normal human being, meets a god, a Kamisama, Kage, who then gives her his god mark, and she becomes the god of a Shinto shrine. And we see when she goes up to the Mikage shrine, there is the tori at the entrance, there is the very, very steep stairs to go up and down in a very high space to find the shrine surrounded by trees and kind of away from civilization, which are all very important traits of a Shinto shrine because they are of utmost value in the Shinto religion. I'm not going to be talking about Kamisamakis very much, but Professor, if you're intrigued, I do strongly recommend it. Just even looking at a few clips on YouTube, it has a great portrayal of Shinto religion, and if it's something that interests you, I really recommend this anime. It is a very light and funny, interesting type of thing. It's very different from Studio Ghibli films, it's very different than My Neighbor Totoro, but it's fantastic and has a great representation and, in a way, explains Shinto religion in a very great way without actually mentioning that it is Shinto religion. So you do have to do your research a little bit on it, but that's one thing I just wanted to kind of bring up. But without further ado, we are going to hop into our first movie analysis, which will be Spirited Away by Studio Ghibli. And so, before I actually get into this, if you have not watched any Studio Ghibli films, or if you have not watched Spirited Away, My Neighbor Totoro, uh, Princess Mononoke, and Nausicaa of the Wind, there will be spoilers in here because I will be talking about clips from like throughout the entire movies. So just be warned, there will be spoilers of these movies as well as spoilers of the books that I will be citing from. Just be warned of spoilers. Again, as I'm saying, this video is really not made with the public in mind. It's made as an assignment. But if you're interested, do know there will be spoilers. So, to begin, Spirited Away is, as most of you will know, my absolute favorite Studio Ghibli movie. It's a movie that's very important to me from my childhood, and so obviously I was super excited to get into a deeper kind of academic lens analysis type of thing for it. And the very first instance where we have a connection to nature, and inevitably a connection to the Shinto religion in here, is when Chihiro and her parents are in the car, they're arriving close to their home, and her dad decides to take a shortcut and we see that as they start riding up the hill there is a very big tree with a tori right just like kind of resting on there a clear indicator that you are entering the spirit world which is stated in this book oftentimes if it's not like a huge red tori then there will often be either a very specific tree that will just be like there and that's kind of the the indicator that they're entering the spirit world or there will be a tori resting against this very big main tree when you see that you know you are leaving the human world behind and entering the spirit world so when chihiro and her parents go past that point and into the forest up the hill that is their indicator that they are officially leaving the real world behind and they are entering the world of spirits which Chihiro eventually makes her way to when they pass another gate. And so as they're driving up the hill, Chihiro asks her mother, Mom, what are those little things, those little houses? And so these are actually tiny shrines for the kami. It is where the gods rest during the day. So these little shrines for the spirits are, once again, an indicator that they are getting deeper and deeper into the spirit world and into this kind of Shinto shrine. But I, I have a reference to make at uh, Yubaba's bathhouse. The fact that it really resembles just a Shinto shrine brings back this connection of like, they're going through the entire process of making their way to the typical Shinto shrine. You've got the Tori gate entrance, You've got the fact that it is hidden by a forest. You've got the fact that it is in very high grounds. They have to go up a very steep hill to get to this point. There are the tiny shrines for the kami gods. Then you get to Yubaba's bathhouse, which really resembles a Shinto shrine. So, 
At this point, I will make a reference to the book The Overstory by Richard Powers. Now, this book doesn't like necessarily depict or uh, focus on Shinto, but there is a kind of main tree that is kept in the family, which I would like to kind of make a reference to both Shinto religion in general as well as this specific scene in Spirited Away. So in Spirited Away, that tree is like the the red light saying, you are entering the spirit world, beware. Obviously that is, it's not the exact same thing in the overstory, but the big family tree does kind of bring this sort of same feeling of, what, what word should I use for this? I guess th this kind of like, I will determine your fate type of thing. See like, in Spirited Away, that big tree is their warning message. And in the overstory, while the tree is not necessarily to blame for everything that happens to this particular family through many, many generations, it is almost always at the root, pun intended, of most of their problems or their success. It's not very, it's not really a direct connection that can be made, but it is nevertheless some kind of similarity that I just kind of want to highlight a little bit in here. And so that that's the first connection that I was able to make between the two. And so after that, uh, now we're moving on to, we're about 10 minutes into the movie, which is where you see the very first example of human greed, which is a huge, huge, huge part in most of the books that we've read. Honestly, where comes nature, there will almost always be human greed attached to it, whether it be cutting down the trees or pollution or just human greed coming in to disrupt the peace of nature. It, it, it's, it's like this. It always comes together. And so the first instance of human greed in here is Chihiro's parents smelling the food once they cross that big, like, okay. That's another reference I'd like to make. You know that big red type of tunnel thing that they go through? I kind of like I kind of saw that as a second huge tori gate, right? Like it, it's not it's not the typical gate, but it is them like at this point they are really like it's the double official crossing into the spirit world. So, yeah, that's another thing. But once they cross that and her dad smells the food and they go bonkers and they find the food which is made for the spirits only and so when her parents start eating it because they are greedy, they don't wait to see if anyone's there and they just start eating. So they sit down and they start eating and they just don't stop. And Chihiro, this doesn't really have much to do <laughs> with the course or the analysis. A child's voice is very worth listening to because they don't have these like world filters so when Chihiro says that she really doesn't feel like they should be eating the food her parents truly should have listened to her because their greed gets them punished and so as they keep eating the food that was made for the spirits they get turned into pigs by Yubaba who is the owner and keeper of the bathhouse and so because of their gluttony, which is one of the seven deadly sins, because of that, they get turned into pigs. And so this is the first example of human greed, which we've seen in almost every single book that we've read for this course. But the one that I would really highlight is Barkskins by Annie Poo. Now, of course, the character names are escaping me, so I will put the names here. But the kind of master in Barkskins he he was incredibly greedy. I'm sure you will agree with this statement. So he was incredibly greedy to make money, to become rich and powerful and famous and have this huge home and just basically be on top of his own little world. And so we also see him very much valuing a lot of food, like having a table filled with a bunch of different foods. And so that's one connection that I made with the parents just going bonkers with the spirit's food and this master annoying man in bark skins. And so that's kind of a, another connection that I made there. I know that's not directly a connection to Forrest, but it's a link between the movie and the book Bark Skins. So that's another one. And I would also like to link back to Shinto. In Shinto religion, having shrines in your household is a very big thing. 
as well as providing offerings of foods. And this is also something that is very big in uh, Korean culture when they are doing a wake for, for someone. If someone has passed away, they will do an offering of the deceased's favorite foods and they will wait after a certain amount of time and then the, the guests or the, the people who are in mourning will eat the foods thinking about the deceased, the good memories that they had about them and they will they'll drink alcohol, they'll have a good time, they'll try to you know lift the spirits a little bit and so food is a very big thing and this is something that's very big in Shinto as well that being said, stealing food from the spirits is one of the worst crimes you can commit in Shinto religion. You are offering up this food to the deceased or to the spirits or to the kami so that you get back from the spirit this protection, this happiness, this peace, this joy. And so if you give food to the spirit so that in turn you will get good luck back, if you steal their food, you will inevitably be given bad luck in return. Hence why they're turned into pigs. Uh, because of their gluttony, which the pig most often represents gluttony, that's why, you know, the bad luck, they get turned into pigs. Karma. <laughs> so, now, about another 40 minutes into the movie, when we get to see the stink spirit, is what Yubaba calls it at the, 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 the first interaction they have with it, but we do eventually come to see that it was a polluted river spirit. So we see this huge glob just get into the bathhouse and they want to take a bath. And so Yubaba, who doesn't want to have anything to do with, you know, like dirtying her hands, she's just kind of doing this for the money. She is a great example of another form of greed for the money, which again makes me think of that master man in bark skins. So she gives this to Chihiro, who is the new girl at the bathhouse, and she has to take the tokens. Thankfully, No Face has given her a bunch of tokens because this spirit is just after Chihiro's approval because it's lonely. It doesn't have anyone worshipping it. It's a lonely spirit. It's looking for someone to give good luck to. So because Chihiro treats Snow Face politely and with care, he returns the good luck. She feels that there's like a thorn in its side, which is a, it's a bicycle. And so uh, Yubaba realizes this is no stink spirit we have on our hands. Everybody get down there. We need to help it. And so they start, no, heave ho, heave ho. They start pulling out the bike which in turn gets all the human pollution to fall out of the spirit. And so because uh, Chihiro is the one who has helped this river spirit, she is rewarded, which is another strong belief of Shintoism. If you help a kami, if you worship a kami, you will be rewarded. And so because Chihiro helps the spirit, it gives her this little kind of meatball looking thing but it's medicine from the river spirit and that river spirit was a very very important river spirit and this little medicine ball is actually what helps her towards the end of the movie to heal Haku. Won't really go into too much detail about that because that's slightly irrelevant but it's such a great part in the film and so this is her reward for helping the spirit. We often see this in Studio Ghibli films. Miyazaki is very insistent in depicting human pollution. In Spirited Away, you have the river spirit who is entirely polluted by human pollution. In Princess Mononoke, you have, I can't remember her name, but she's after making iron. They're all after, you know, capital um, interests. They just want to make money. They're chopping down trees, they're polluting, they are killing the, a the animals and the spirits of the forest. They don't, they don't care. And I know this is not one that I'm going to be focusing on, but in Howl's Moving Castle, while there's not really any direct connect, like link to pollution, there is a direct link to a war that was ongoing when Miyazaki made this film. And so we do see how this war brings forth a whole lot of pollution, a whole lot of destruction, right? And so Miyazaki really focuses on that. and. In Spirited Away, we see it with the river spirit being polluted by human beings. And now another thing that I would like to bring up is the way that Miyazaki gives a person- a kind of personifies or gives a persona- personif- 
Oh my god, I can't talk. How Miyazaki gives a person. Just gonna roll with it, okay? He person. <laughs> elements of nature are personified. So you have a bunch of natural elements that are personified and turned into like these living, breathing thing, which I would like to link to The Hidden Life of Trees. So The Hidden Life of Trees is written by Peter Wohlben. I don't know if I pronounced that right. Fingers crossed. Anyways, uh, this book was actually not a full book that we had to read for a course. We had to read just a section of it, but I loved it so much that I ran to the bookstore and I bought it. And so in this book, we really see how trees are indeed living, breathing things. They are crazy similar to human beings. Trees can smell, can feel, can technically touch. They almost have all of the human senses, but these are altered to trees. In this book, everything that I'll be saying right now is taken from this book. It's not my own knowledge, okay? I'm not that smart about trees, but this book taught me so much. First thing being that trees can smell and they can feel. So for example, if uh, some kind of insect is starting to eat at the, let's say a, um, oh, how do you say chenille in English? Why is my brain doing that? A caterpillar. Okay. Shiny caterpillar. So let's say a caterpillar is eating at the leaves on a tree. Uh, the tree will feel it and so it will send out a signal to nearby trees to tell them there's, there's a threat, okay? Be careful. Start releasing the chemical that the caterpillar will start tasting in the leaves and realize like, oh, I'm in danger here. I need to stop eating the leaves. So the trees have these protection mechanisms of, first off, they feel the pain of being eaten. Then they send out a message to the nearby trees to get them to release this chemical right away so they can protect themselves. And then they, the, the, the tree itself that first felt it, start releasing the chemical. And while it might take a little while for the chemical to start being released and thus saving its leaves, there's still the fact that trees feel and they can communicate. And the question still stands of whether or not there's some kind of consciousness to trees, that they're conscious they're doing this, but nevertheless, they still have systems of like, here's a warning that I'm shooting out, and then I'm gonna release these chemicals to protect myself so that my leaves stay stay on me. I guess, obviously, in Spirited Away, the, the natural elements are really, really, like, made into these human-like things. But I would like to think that other than just this kind of magical aspect to it, Miyazaki kind of takes into consideration the fact that nature is indeed alive. Again, a Shintoist belief. I, I like to think that he takes that into consideration and incorporates it in most of his movies because most of his movies has natural elements that are personified, that are given human-like qualities, which I didn't know this before, but trees do have human-like qualities in real life. And obviously these are altered to the life of trees, but still stands that they have senses just like humans do. And so that's another little connection that I wanted to make there. So that is the first analysis uh, that I wanted to do for Spirited Away. It's a movie about self-discovery, young love, self-growth. Very, very important. We see how Chihiro who is this kind of spoilt kid, gets to uh, Yubaba's bathhouse and learns how to become more autonomous and more responsible. So that was kind of all I wanted to say for Spirited Away. Now we are going to move on to the next movie, which is Princess Mononoke. Hello there. Uh, we have changed places and changed outfits because today is another day. This project is being recorded over a couple different days, so please just ignore that. But we are now on to the analysis of Princess Mononoke. The very first thing I'd like to talk about regarding Princess Mononoke is the very obvious parts of this movie that are direct examples of Shinto, which are all of the forest spirits. In this movie, you have the wolf gods who have taken in Mononoke and have kind of brought her up as 
their own child but then you also have a bunch of different forest spirits which i will put a few of them over here and then you have the forest spirit which in a sense kind of acts as this representation of god or this almighty presence so obviously all the forest spirits are looking for peace and then we have the humans who come in and are starting to destroy the forest to produce more iron they are harming nature and in turn they're trying to kill the forest spirits both like the the uh, main forest spirits as well as all the other spirits within the forest they are trying to get them out of their way and they are also trying to get the benefits of killing the forest spirit however we come to see that when the forest spirit dies nature dies with it as well so we have these two parallels at the beginning of the movie and when ashitaka is being chased by this huge demon boar which was at first one of the the ruling spirits of the forest the the boar spirit and this spirit was taken over by such strong hatred is kind of referred to as a demon in a way so the spirit turns evil and the kind of the evil seeps out of the boar and snatches ashitaka's arm which is kind of the starting point of this entire story because that is what makes him go on this journey to hopefully heal and stay alive we see this poisonous hatred which is the root of all evil basically in a way in this movie and there is something that is called miasma the way that i came to learn about like miasma and uh the dangers of hatred and evilness and the the harm that it brings when looked at in a shinto lens was in kamisama kiss there's an episode where there's this box that was uh, covered in talismans to keep the evil within the box and then it accidentally is released and so the entire shrine is covered in miasma because there's a demon, uh, th there's this huge source of evil and hatred and all these negative sources that is just kind of swallowing up the shrine as a whole and so Nanami has to ward off this miasma demon, whatever, by doing a traditional dance with the, uh, I don't know what it's called, but the, the bell instrument. This is a traditional dance in the Shinto religion. It's a traditional dance to ward off demons and evil. And so that's kind of how I came to be familiar with this idea of miasma. And it's often portrayed as this kind of dark purple slimy substance we've seen it in uh, spirited away when the stink spirit goes into the bath when the brown substance starts getting off of it there are also these blobs of purple stuff and that purple stuff is basically miasma so this evil wrongdoing type of presence and for the case of spirited away it was human pollution human greed human carelessness and so in princess mononoke the purple thing that took over the boar spirit and then took over ashitaka's arm and was slowly killing him was evil and hatred this all ties back to the the iron production in the in the movie these people are only focused on money success riches they don't care what they have to do in order to gain these and so they're willing to kill the forest spirit kill the beings within the forest and kill the forest and nature itself and so their selfishness and their greed is what gets them in trouble in the end and it is what kind of created this miasma and this evilness to start coming out and attacking the forest as well as attacking uh, the peoples in the villages near this like one headquarters and for my connection to a book that we've read i would like to link this to the word for world is forest by ursula Le Guin. the the connection is pretty evident for you professor since you know what the book is about in the word for world is forest we have these two peoples we have human beings who have gone into space onto this other planet to start cutting down the trees of the ashtians are uh, genetically related to humans but they're kind of these sort of 
different beings. They're described as being these short green fuzzy uh, creatures and for some reason I could only see mini Grinches walking around everywhere uh, when I was reading the book. But anyways, that is kind of the link that, that I made when I was watching the movie. The people who are harvesting the iron are kind of just the regular human beings in the word for world is forest who are harvesting all the trees and just chopping everything down for their own benefits and so then we have ashitaka and his people along with all the spirits and the forest spirit within the forest who kind of represent the ashtheans they are just here for peace and protecting the forest but because humans have started attacking them where they were once peaceful beings, they are forced to learn violence and attack. So in the word for world is forest, Ashtians were known to be these very peaceful beings. They did not know anything about violence. They did not fight back. But because humans started attacking them, taking what was their higher presence, the nature in the forest, they learned from the humans how to fight, how to be violent, how to kill and so they fight back. So that's kind of the link that I was able to make there. And obviously there's also the, the main focus on capitalism that we see in Barkskins that is obviously relevant in this case. They're so focused on just making a bunch of money and making these weapons and just being very like, we don't care what we have to do to get the money, we're just gonna do it. That is also a very big theme in the first part as well as throughout Barkskins. It's a huge deal. So that was another link that I made over there. I guess there's also natural elements are personified. They're given personalities. Whether they talk or not, they, they interact with humans. And so that is once again a connection that I made with the hidden life of trees where trees have some of the human senses. There's again this idea that what we know in our real world of like animals don't have voices and trees can't feel and the forest cannot feel it doesn't it doesn't really have that much power miyazaki in most of his films shows us that these beliefs are wrong especially in princess mononoke the, the forest is so important it, it has brought me to tears the amount of i've watched that movie countless times and the scene where the forest spirit dies and then comes back to life it brings me to tears every single time. It's such a beautiful scene and it's such a powerful scene that I can't help but be brought to tears. And so that's the next part in the film that I would like to refer to is how nature heals. And so this is something that we have both read about but it's also something that we've discussed in class just in general. And it is that nature truly does heal. There is a reason why we have a saying of go hug a tree, you'll feel better. And in this film, we are shown exactly just how it can heal when Ashitaka is shot countless times. And so uh, Mononoke takes him to like the heart of the forest and leaves him there. And so Yakul, which is Ashitaka's loyal red elk. We see that when Mononoke is starting to walk away, Yakul knows not to go on this little bit of island because the, the healing process is going to, to begin and it's so incredibly powerful, it cannot be interrupted. This is the, the first time when Ashitaka is put on this little piece of island, we see the forest spirit kind of take this huge like form the first time that we see the forest spirit we see it as this red elk with a kind of human face and it, it just keeps walking but it is also surrounded by light which is often like that that's the stereotypical portrayal of a god or some kind of higher presence. So that's the first time we see it, but when Ashitaka is on that little piece of land and is dying, we see the forest spirit take on its, like, true form and just starts, like, anyways, we see the forest spirit take on its true form and then it slowly starts healing Ashitaka. And so, in this sense, nature heals. You know, hug a tree, you'll feel better. This is something that is heavily portrayed in this movie as well as throughout Miyazaki's work in general. And this is once again a huge, huge, huge component of Shinto. In Shinto, nature is 
technically like this almighty presence it is worshipped is it, it is beloved and it heals so th there's a reason why most shinto shrines are at the heart of a forest or are surrounded by nature because it's peaceful it is calm it is quiet and it heals it's a it's a source of peace and comfort that worshippers can look to and come to when they need that kind of inner peace and even in other religions for example christian religion there's a place that i always go to with my parents my grandfather would go walk there every single morning it's called the saint anne in uh, caracat in new brunswick it is a beautiful place and every single time i go to see my mom's side of the family in tracadie we we go walk the saint anne which is very similar to shinto because it is in the middle of the forest right by the sea you have to walk this path through the forest and it has these kinds of i guess we could say sculptures of moments in the bible and so I, I typically go there for the peace that nature brings me and also because my parents took me there regularly when I was a very very little kid and so it, it brings me a lot of comfort to be there and nature gives me a lot of peace and just my mind which never shuts up when I'm there completely blank. It is one of the only times that my mind just stops running 24 7 and so i guess that in a way shinto and shinto shrines kind of bring the same comfort to worshipers because it is deep in the forest where it is calm peaceful quiet and in this movie we show how if humankind comes to disrupt this peace then inevitably there will be bad things that are going to happen and the the spirits will fight back they will fight back against the miasma, they'll fight back after humankind to to kind of try to gain this peace back. And another thing that I want to mention about how the, the nature heals Ashitaka, this is also something that we saw throughout the course that trees heal each other right we saw now i can't remember which specific kinds of trees and i can't for the life of me remember which book we saw this in i do believe it was in the hidden life of trees with the fungal networks that trees have beneath ground they are able to help other trees around them whether it be uh, a tree that is sick or just if a tree needs help and it's surrounded by the right kinds of trees they can swap what they need. If there's a tree that just fell down to the ground and it is slowly dying, it's gonna start feeding the other trees as it dies. Which isn't that just so heartbreakingly beautiful? Gives its very last life sources to its surrounding trees, the, the surrounding systems. And so that ties back to how nature heals. Trees heal each other, they heal themselves, they keep other trees alive, and they also help humans obviously not in the very same way but you know still we we look to nature to you know we we garden we plant we grow we consume we start again so there was that and so over an hour into the movie we also see the ache of the forest and obviously this is a theme that we see throughout the entire movie because this is what this movie is about it is the ache of the forest that is caught you know like humans are just they're killing it so obviously the forest is in pain it is aching to have this state of calm and peace back and to not have all this killing happening the excruciating pain that it's going through with humans just continuing to take its sources out and just harvesting everything but we see this ache of the forest which again ties back to this idea of trees can feel so as i've mentioned if a caterpillar is eating at the leaves of the tree it will feel this pain and send out through the fungal networks underground they'll send out messages to the surrounding trees to start letting out the chemicals and protect themselves and so in this movie we see how the forest indeed feels feels pain it can it can be in warning it can ache 
it can communicate its pain to others see the true power of the forest when the forest spirit comes back so that was it for my analysis of princess mononoke now the next movie that i want to talk about is nausicaa of the wind and this this one i won't go into too much detail about it because there's only really one scene that i want to focus on and that is the tree growing beneath ground so once again in this movie human pollution is a huge issue that is addressed throughout the entirety of the film we see throughout the movie that eventually human pollution gets so bad that the jungle dies however nature being as powerful as it is finds a way to kind of like flip things over quite literally with a whole new jungle growing beneath ground under the jungle at the top who just like died and then beneath the ground we see this huge tree just completely it looks so healthy it looks beautiful again breathtaking brought me to tears and so the link that i i made with this is once again the concept of fungal systems beneath grounds and how trees keep each other alive and as i've mentioned earlier for the princess mononoke analysis uh, when a tree falls down or dies or is at the end of its lifetime it's gonna start slowly giving out its remaining sources to the other trees around it that are younger and are still alive and kicking right and so the fact that the jungle above ground that completely died out because of human pollution even if it died out it managed to give out its remaining sources to another system below ground who is now thriving and so especially because it's the whole above below ground thing there's this obvious connection to the fungal systems that trees have below ground which allows them to communicate with trees and transfer the, those resources and keep each other alive so that was kind of the first connection that i made and so even if it's dead it has a whole lot of value when it comes to nature and the forest so that was kind of the the only thing I really wanted to talk about when it comes to Nausicaa of the Wind. It's a great movie. It is not necessarily, it's not one that I've watched a lot in Studio Ghibli, hence why I don't want to go into too much of an, an analysis. I feel like I haven't watched it enough to really go in depth and into a lot of details. Nevertheless, a super important moment and a very good example to connect with our course readings. All right. We are on to our last movie analysis, and that is My Neighbor Totoro. I have so many connections to make with this movie. The very first being that Totoro reminds me of Ashtians in The Word for World is Forest, because he's kind of like this, this forest spirit, this very important forest being who is in the forest and who protects it because it is, it's, 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 it's his home, which is exactly what the Ashtians do. And so Totoro is kind of like this creature who does no harm, knows no harm, cannot be evil, and so on and so forth. Same concept as the Ashtians before they were attacked by humankind and were then forced to retaliate. Another aspect of the movie that I would like to bring up is the camphor tree. It's where Totoro lives. On this wiki page, it says that the camphor tree is about 25 meters tall. That is tall. It's an evergreen tree and it produces clusters of blackberry-like fruit. Once again, we get this kind of sense of a main center tree, which is relevant in Shinto. And in Shinto, most of the trees that are kind of worshipped or are important in the religion are evergreens. So once again, in this movie, we have Totoro, who is kind of the guardian of the forest, much like how that the forest spirit in Princess Mononoke was like the primary guardian of the forest. I have another very fun fact. Totoro was inspired by a tree. So he was inspired by a sacred 1000 year old cedar tree that looks just like the Ghibli forest spirit, Totoro. But it is affectionately referred to as the Kosugi no Osugi by the locals, the sacred cedar tree has also earned the moniker of Totoro tree, and it's not hard to see why. 
it looks exactly like him. So that was just a little quick little fun fact for you. I, I just wanted to add that in. So going back to the giant camphor tree where Totoro lives, it is said that it's another nod to the Shinto-inspired pantheism. So it's a recurring motif, the sacred tree, or to use the Shinto term, Shinboku, is decorated with Shimenawa, a rope used to mark sanctity and towers over Satsuki and Mei's family home. So the tree that towers over the two little girls' home kind of shows that the nature in the forest is protecting them. So Totoro is protecting them, taking care of them as their mother is sick and can't really take care of them or do this kind of motherly act of protecting their children. The forest takes over, which is again a very common theme that we have seen in Miyazaki's work, but it's also, there. there's a reason why nature is called mother nature. It's a very mothering presence. It takes care of its children. So there's also a reason why we often see uh, orphaned children taken in by animals of the forest. We, we see it in Princess Mononoke when the, the wolf gods take Mononoke as their own. We see it in My Neighbor Totoro when Totoro protects Satsuki and Mei. We also see it in The Jungle Book when uh, Mowgli is taken in by the Black Panther, right? It's, it's everywhere, this idea of animals taking in human beings that are orphaned, given away, or their parents have died, or whatever. There's a reason why nature is called Mother Nature, and I'm sure that's probably not like the main reason, but nature nurtures, right? So another little connection in there for you. And another very common theme that we see in My Neighbor Totoro is uh, industrialization, pollution, the way that nature has changed over the years. We see that Mei and Satsuki's parents often kind of reminiscize on how Japan used to be before all this industrialization. When Satsuki Mei and their, their father visit Totoro's Shinboku, he's like, he, he says something like, oh, a magnificent tree. It's been around since long ago, back in the time when trees and people used to be friends. I don't even need to unpack that, but it again hints at human tendency to just destroy everything that is peaceful for money. And so, with Mei and Satsuki's mother being terribly ill, we, we don't know by the end of the movie whether she recovers or not, but it's still incredibly comforting and emotional and, and very emotionally touching to see how this force spirit, Totoro, takes the kids under his wing, takes care of them when their mother is too sick to do it. Even though this is incredibly serious, the, the girls are able to kind of draw this parallel between the declining health of their mother and that of like the, the natural world around them, especially when Totoro and the other forest spirits are taking care of them, they are nurturing them. And so this also ties back to the over story once again, there's this idea of like a main tree for multiple generations and has been at the root of many family issues as well as success. So in the case of my neighbor Totoro, the, 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 the tree where Totoro lives is what protects the kids, they, it protects their household. And so in the overstory, we have this kind of similar mindset where the, this tree has been around for multiple generations and brings father and son together through all of these generations. Am I done? I think I'm done. Well, that was it. I absolutely loved making this project. And so I do hope that I have done all these movies and Shinto religion justice. I would like to state, I know I probably should have said this at the beginning of the video, but I am in no way, shape or form a professional. I have not necessarily been studying anime or Japanese culture for all that long. I do not want to say that I, what, what I say is 1000% accurate. I will say that I did my research, and so what I've been talking about has been researched for quite a few months, and in fact quite a few years because I've been watching these movies for so long. I, of course, may have 
you know, I mentioned how this might not be the best book to be citing from, but it is the book that I have the time to read. And so if any of what I said about this is incorrect, I apologize so much. Please give me other sources, links, whatever, regarding Shinto, regarding Japanese culture, regarding some of the anime movies that I talked about, so that I can better educate myself because I genuinely, truly, 1000% care about this. And I want to make sure that what I talk about in the future is accurate. But I just wanted to say that I'm not a professional. Uh, I am just someone who decided to share her final project with the internet, and I just I just hope that it was entertaining. But yes, Professor, that is it for my project. I, again, thank you so much for letting me do it in this format. And for all of my little raindrops who decided to watch this like hour-long video, I hope that you found some interesting stuff in it. I hope that maybe I taught you a thing or two? Maybe? You know, that would be fun. I would just really genuinely want to thank any of you who have watched up to this point other than my professor because this is my project. It, you, I can't even tell you how much it means to me that you have watched until this point in the video because I know it's a long one. But thank you so, so, so much for taking some time in your day to watch my content and in turn for supporting one of my final projects at university. I'm not graduating this year, I just mean like final projects for this class that I'm taking at university. I'm still a third year. I'm graduating in 2024. Anyways, thank you so much. I do really hope you enjoyed it. So if you did enjoy this video, it would be absolutely fantastic if you left it a thumbs up because it, it kind of just, you know, it's gonna make me feel a little bit better about spending so many hours on a YouTube video for a project. So in a way, you're kind of showing my professor that this was a good project. But I, I am kidding. If you want to leave it a thumbs up, go ahead. It's up to you. And if you would like to join the Little Raindrops family, feel free to subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell to be notified when I post new content. I typically post every single Monday. The only reason I am posting this on a Friday is because it's due today. So thank you so very much for watching and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, professor, for an amazing semester. I also hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you found some fun stuff. And that's it. I will see you guys in the next one.